Hi everyone, this is your Unit 1B test review. Um, this test is going to cover food webs and energy. So you need to make sure that you understand your food webs, your food chains, your energy pyramid, your laws of thermodynamics, um, as well as some of your ecosystem interaction stuff such as symbiosis and competition. So we'll be reviewing that during this video. Make sure you review any of the bold vocab that's throughout your notes. Um, you should definitely know that there's both biotic and abiotic factors that are influencing how ecosystems interact. Um, so how animals and plants interact with things like wind, water, rain, uh, the temperature, or the climate of a particular location. So know that your biotic factors is anything living. And remember what we talked about in class. If you put a or an in front of a word, usually it means not or non. So abiotic factors are going to be non-living as opposed to living. So things like nutrients, water, wind, rain, um, all of these would be influencing the interactions within that ecosystem. You are going to need to know uh, your types of symbiosis as well as be able to identify uh, those types of symbiosis based on uh, different relationships and actual real life examples. So part of what you had to include in your study card was also uh, a little chart on this too. So if you need a little bit of help with that, you are welcome to use some of the information that's listed here. So you should know that mutualism, um, you have a mutually beneficial relationship, which means both organisms are benefiting. I use the two smiley faces for that. So things such as bees pollinating flowers because the bee is getting um, pollen and help for its hive where the flowers are also being pollinated, um, which is difficult for them to do without the help of bees. We have commensalism where you have one organism benefiting where the other one doesn't really care. There's no really real effect for it. So for example, you could have moss hanging on oak trees. The moss is not actually taking nutrients from the oak tree, so it's not harming it. And then parasitism, you have one organism benefiting, we call that the parasite, whereas the host um, is the one that is being harmed in that relationship. Um, and sometimes with parasitism, there can be more than just two organisms within that relationship. So for example, mosquitoes uh, feed on blood, but the malaria parasite actually uses the mosquito as a vector or transporting agent um, to transport itself from one organism to another organism, usually humans in that case. Uh, fleas on dogs is another example, as well as mistletoe on trees. Mistletoe, unlike moss, does actually take nutrients out of the tree and does harm it. So you'll often see dead areas around where mistletoe is found in trees. You're also going to need to know what competition is. Um, remember that overall competition is just when you have two organisms with interlapping uh, or overlapping, sorry, niches uh, or their role in the environment that they will often end up competing. So the example that we use in class was the two different types of barnacles. We said that the um, fundamental niche of both of those barnacles is to cover a majority of the cliff. And so in the case of the picture on your screen there, you can see that with competition occurring, the blue Bolanus barnacles end up taking over what they prefer to have their realized niche because they're bigger, they're stronger, and it's easier for them to take over their chunk of the cliff, which leaves the other type of barnacle, the brown one, um, with just the upper part of the cliff. They still will get exposed to some water coverage with high and low tide, but their realized niches ultimately are not necessarily the same as their fundamental, what they would like to have, niche. Um, you should also know that uh, interspecific competition is when you have different species, so like with the barnacles, where intraspecific competition is within the same species. So for example, two male wolves competing for a female wolf to mate with would be intraspecific, not interspecific. Related to your competition is resource partitioning. Um, sometimes when you have very similar species, such as the warblers shown over on the right, um, seeking out resources within the same general location, they might divide up that location so that they are not directly competing with each other because you don't have one stronger than the other. They're all kind of just about the same, um, but still need to have access to that resource. So you can see where they've taken up certain parts of the tree there, like Cape May Warbler prefers the upper part of the tree towards the outside, whereas the uh, Black-throated Green Warbler prefers the um, edges of the tree to the middle of the tree. So it helps to reduce direct competition while still providing resources for very similar species. All right, on to primary productivity. So you should know that GPP stands for gross primary productivity, whereas NPP stands for net primary productivity. 
and then R is for respiration. So the formula that you will need to have memorized for the exam is that NPP equals GPP minus R, or net primary productivity equals your gross overall total primary productivity minus the amount of energy used for respiration by the producers that did the production of the gross primary productivity. So your primary productivity in general is just how fast or the rate at which producers in a given area are able to produce their biomass. Generally, this is the plant matter or glucose that they're making through photosynthesis. They are also going to be doing respiration. So some of that glucose is going to be used for their own respiration purposes to help make energy within their cells or ATP. And what you're left with is net primary productivity. So that net productivity is the energy that's going to be available to the next level of consumers within your food web or food chain. Um, so usually your herbivores are your primary consumers. So that energy is going to get passed up the food chain, but you're not going to get the entire gross or overall amount of energy or biomass produced passed along. You're only going to get the net productivity passed along. Um, and then we also talked about in class that productivity can be impacted by certain things like temperature or uh, precipitation or moisture available uh, to the producers within the ecosystem. Um, so in the case of rainforests, they're going to be highly productive because it's usually pretty warm and pretty wet most of the time. Um, but if you were to go somewhere like into the eastern United States, we will often see uh, during fall and winter leaf changes um, where they start to change colors and the trees kind of shut down a little bit in the winter and fall because they don't have the temperature uh, and moisture availability to continue the same rate of uh, production. So temperature and moisture are going to be key things that allow producers, particularly plants, uh, to produce their gross primary productivity at their current rate. So part of the test, you are going to have to do a primary productivity um, calculation. There will be one or two on there. So you need to know, again, your formula, that net primary productivity equals gross primary productivity minus respiration. But be ready to also calculate um, just the GPP or just the R if the other parts of the formula are given to you. So for example, in this particular problem, we have um, the gross and the net given to us, and we're supposed to find the rate of respiration. That is left. So you'll need to rearrange your formula. So take your NPP equals GPP minus R and flip it all around and you'll get R actually is gross primary productivity minus net primary productivity. So if we write this into our formula we would have R equals the 13,000 of the gross productivity minus the 4,000 of the net productivity giving us a 9,000 um, units of energy is used during respiration by the plants. And that is what um, the R, again, that formula would be. So you may have to calculate NPP, GPP, or R. So make sure you know the formula and be prepared to do that. All right, on to how that energy actually flows through an ecosystem. Um, you should know that the ultimate source of energy, even though we don't show it in a food web or food chain, in an ecosystem is the sun. So the sun is constantly inputting energy into the system because your two laws of thermodynamics tell us that energy is not going to be a consistent thing. Um, your first law tells us the energy is not created or destroyed, it's changing form. So basically we have energy flowing in from the sun. That sun energy is going to be used by your producers to make things like glucose. That gets passed along up your food web or food chain, but a lot of it is lost usually to the form of heat or waste. That's your second law of thermodynamics. So energy tends to become less useful as you move through the ecosystem from producers up to your top level carnivores. Um, and that useful energy is going to be decreasing. Again, we usually lose about 90% of it to heat. Here's a quick review of a few of the organisms you're gonna see in a food web before we apply some of that energy knowledge we just got to an actual food web and energy pyramid. Um, herbivores, remember herbs are plants, so herbivores are plant eaters. They're usually also your primary consumers. Omnivores, omni means everything, uh, so they are going to be your everything eaters, your plant and your animal or insect eaters. Remember, insects do technically qualify as meat. Uh, and then carnivores, remember carne, so carne in Spanish means meat. Hopefully you learned that from your Spanish class. So carnivores are going to be your meat eaters or your top level consumers. Usually they're going to be either a uh, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary level consumer. So higher up in your food chain or food web. 
Then we also have our decomposers and we have our detritivores. So decomposers usually break down dead things, things like bacteria, um, mushrooms, or fungi would be doing this. And they are going to help recycle nutrients through the environment. So they're usually contributing quite a bit to your biogeochemical cycles. So think of like nitrogen, for example, being decomposed from an old dead plant that's being broken down by maybe a mushroom in a forest. And then detritivores, they eat dead things. Uh, the term detritus literally means dead stuff in an ecosystem. So detritivores are eating your dead stuff. Okay, so for the 10% rule, remember that this is an average rate of the amount of energy passed them up among your trophic levels on your food chain, or in this case, our energy pyramid. Um, so on average, as we go from one level to the next, we are going to have about 10% of our energy passed along. It's not always that much. We did some problems in class where sometimes it can vary a little bit, but it is 10% on average. Then from primary consumer to secondary consumer, we would have, for example, whatever is available at primary passed along to secondary at a 10% rate. And then secondary to tertiary, about 10% of your energy is going to be passed along as well. So as you are going up your food web or food chain, you can see we're going to have a decrease in energy, hence why we use this pyramid or triangle shape. So about 90% of your energy is going to be lost. So we're going to have at each level, 90% leaving, usually in the form of heat. So 10% gets passed along, 10% gets passed along, 90% is lost to heat and to waste. You should be able to do your 10% calculation. So remember the easy way to do that is if you have, for example, 100 units of energy, let's say at your producer level, and we want to know how much is at the primary consumer level, you move your decimal in one. And if we had 100 again at producer, we are now going to have 10 at the primary consumer level. The other 90 is lost to usually heat. If we move it in one more, then at our secondary level, we would just have one. If we were to move it in one more at our tertiary level, we'd have 0.1. So make sure you're able to do those 10% calculations. And then you will also need to be able to tell me how much energy is lost. So if I ask how much energy is lost between the producer to the secondary consumers, you would take 100 and you would subtract 1. And then the amount of energy lost in those two jumps up the food chain would be 99. All right, last thing we need to make sure we know for the exam is biomagnification, um, which we talked about in class in reference to DDT. Uh, DDT is an insecticide. Uh, mercury is another uh, compound that is going to biomagnify quite frequently, which means that as you go up a food chain from producer to consumer, consumer and so on, the amount of toxin within the organisms at those levels is going to increase because it's building up within their body. So these toxins, uh, DDT again being a really famous example because it did almost wipe out bald eagles, um, these toxins have to be long-lived and difficult to break down within the environment and within the organism. They also are going to accumulate faster than they can be eliminated from the body. So that means that if the eagle is taking in like three units a day, maybe it's only able to eliminate one unit a day. And so that means that two units are carrying through to the next day and over time it's just going to accumulate and build up more and more. They also have to be bioactive within the organism. So DDT, for example, caused eggshell thinning. Um, so that's a good example to try to remember if you were ever asked on an FRQ, maybe on the AP exam at the end of the year. Um, and that eggshell thinning led to the death of a lot of bald eagle chicks. And so if the chicks weren't making it to adulthood, that population would decline pretty rapidly. Uh, and stuff like this did end up with the bald eagle on the endangered species list for quite a while. And they've only recently started to recover um, to where we could downlist them to threatened as opposed to endangered.